afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that delicious lunch. Thanks again to Hartfields, I think. Um, I like to call it, instead of the neural cognitive um, fancy expression, brain health. So we're going to refer to it as that. So the presentation I'm using is actually from the Department of Health and um, social, social, human services, excuse me, and I just adapted it, so this is available to everyone, and I adapted it based on the audience. So um, we're going to go through the presentation. There's um, three key areas I'm going to focus on is different ways to protect your brain, um, also some threats or risks to our brain health, and then how to get started or to take action. So all of you hopefully got two handouts um, just now. Um, and I'm going to refer to them. But this one here first is a great overview of what I'm going to be speaking of. You're certainly um, free to take notes. But be between the front and back side, it gives a nice synopsis. And the protecting your brain health is kind of like your action card for you to take home and decide after this presentation if there's something uh, that we discuss here that you'd like to do. And then hopefully you all got a little sticky. And at the end, we're going to have a call to action where you're going to choose one of those items, and we're going to stick it on this um, brain right here. Um, I also like to keep my presentations very interactive. So if you have questions anytime during a slide, feel free to ask. You don't have to wait to the end. OK. So aging and health, as you all know, from the time we're born to where we are now, we begin the aging process. So um, aging well depends on lots of things, our genes, our lifestyle choices, and our environment. So adopting healthy habits, such as staying involved in communities, uh, using preventive services for our health, managing our conditions, whether it's with lifestyle changes or medications, really can help maintain um, a healthy brain. But even if you are healthy, um, changes in memory and learning as you age can include some of the ones on the slide there. For example, maybe more challenges with us multitasking. Uh, perhaps we sometimes have difficulty finding words. Have you ever started a conversation and realized you know what you want to say, it's right there, but it doesn't come out? Um, or sometimes we have like a little lapse in our attention, you know, we're wandering off. Those are all normal things that can happen. Um, but the good news is there's things you can do about it. So you can improve some of your skills. And as, as I go through this presentation, we're going to talk about some things you can do. Learning new things is so important for our brain. Uh, creating, uh, which also creates new memories, and then of course um, can improve our vocabulary, especially if we're doing something in regards um, to reading. So interestingly enough, when I was preparing this for the caregivers, does anyone know the average age of a caregiver in the U.S.? 70. 50. 50 is very close. 49 years old. So that's in the US, the average. It means we have some people that are older, some people that are younger, but 49 years old. So you might be surprised by that number, but you think about um, people that age may be taking care of parents. They may be caregivers for children as well. Um, and as we get older, you know, we're faced with a lot of these things that I mentioned here. OK. So we're going to go over a couple of these areas, uh, these five key areas about protecting our brain. Uh, we'll talk slight, uh, quickly, well, m less quickly, because um, nutrition is my forte. I'm a registered dietitian, so I'll probably spend a little bit more time on that. Um, some exercise or being physically active, how to keep our brain active, um, social connections, which we are finding through research are so important, and sleep. And we cannot underestimate the power of sleep. All right. So the first one, healthy eating. So good nutrition is important for all of us, no matter what phase in life we are in or what we're going through. As the speaker this morning had mentioned how important nutrition is, and they are doing a lot of research on different groups, such as caregivers. Because as caregivers, we don't necessarily have the time to put ourselves first, So because we're care taking care of whether it's parents or children or anybody in our family, and we're always you know, the last ones. And that's really um, indicative, too, more so of women. Um, we tend to really put ourselves last on that spectrum. But you might notice some of those healthy eating tips from USDA's MyPlate. I'm assuming everyone is familiar with USDA's MyPlate, that nice little colorful icon. All right, 
So healthy eating tips include things like eating um, less sugar, salt, and fat, but more so focusing on the things we should be doing, which is more fruits and vegetables, uh, more whole grains, more lean proteins, whether they're plant or animal-based, um, and low-fat dairy products. So I loved our lunch today because it kind of fits all those boxes. Not only was it colorful with our fruits and vegetables, there was fiber in there, there was some nice low-fat protein. So that gives you, what we had today is a good example of um, foods that can actually be health, healthy for our brains. Um, also, too, don't forget about portion sizes and fluids. Um, in terms of dehydration, you might be interested to know, um, I have a friend who works in ER, then the winter time is sometimes when they see the most cases of dehydration. Because we don't think about drinking in the winter, we're always very conscious of us not go being dehydrated in the summertime, but especially if you're caring for older adults, you have to consider that they, they much easier, be, much more easier become dehydrated um, than uh, younger people. Okay, so within that healthy eating, though there's not a perfect food out there uh, that will help with our cognitive skills or keep our brain sharp, there are some foods, and this is a very short list that I'm highlighting, there are some foods that can actually help promote good brain health. And it's because they may contain nutrients such as omega-3 fatty acids, I'm sure you've heard that term, I'll explain what that is in a second. Um, they contain some vitamins, like vitamin K, in, in this list that I have here. Um, they also have some vitamins uh, as, as the B vitamins as well. So um, on the right-hand side, I'm not going to talk too much about them, but there are some other foods as well. If you go on any website, whether you go on CDC, the Center for Disease, uh, Centers for Disease, um, Centers for Disease um, Control and Prote uh, Prevention, thank you, um, or if you go on NIH or the Academy of Nutrition Dietetics, you're gonna see lists that are gonna have some of these food overlap, but you'll also see some other foods out there. So I just chose um, those on the left side to kind of just do a quick overview for. So the first one is green leafy vegetables. Anyone wanna shout out some that fall in that category? Sp kale. Spinach, kale, arugula, arugula collard greens, Okay, broccoli. All right, so all those fall in the green leafy vegetables. So the nutrients um, for them are that they are very high in vitamin K. And for some people, if they're on a blood thinner, they have to limit that. However, um, in addition to the vitamin K, they have something called lutein in them, folate, and beta carotene. And all of these nutrients um, have been shown to slow cognitive um, decline. So if you're concerned about the memory and some of the things that we talked about earlier, some of these, um, those green leafy vegetables can play that role. And lutein is very important for eye health, especially if there's a family history of macular degeneration. Um, lutein in any of those green leafy vegetables can help there. Again, not cure, but can slow down um, developing that disease. How about fatty fish? What comes to mind? Salmon. Salmon? Tuna, especially the chunk, uh, the chunk light. The chunk white, which is a higher quality, doesn't have as much oils as the chunk light. Anything else? Oil. I'm sorry? You want that, oil? that yes, if it's, especially if it's, if it's, yes, you can. You don't have to, but you'll get a little bit more of those heart healthy fats, especially if it's like an olive oil. Macro Mackerel falls into there, and then also um, cod and Pollock. They're cold water as well. So in that case, they're, they're full of those omega-3 fatty acids. And the research that there is kind of emerging now for that is that omega-3 fatty acids have been linked to um, lower blood levels of the beta amyloid protein. Are you all familiar with that is, beta amyloid? That is actually the protein that causes the clumping in our brain that leads to Alzheimer's disease. So there's a lot of research being done on how to unclump and if there's anything that's within our diet or lifestyle that can do that. So there's some, again, not proven, but some interesting research that they're doing with omega-3 fatty acids, which are those ones that we just mentioned in some of the um, fish. Now, if you, can, if you enjoy fish, um, try to have it at least twice a week 
for, for, for some reasons, if you can't eat it, you're allergic to it for whatever reason, just don't like it, um, you can think about omega-3 supplements. However, whenever you're adding supplements, always check with your healthcare provider. I'll talk a little bit more about this in depth, but just like vitamins and herbal supplements and over-the-counter medications, they can interact with any prescriptions and can have some negative effects. Um, also, too, um, you can think of, if you want to look at some of the um, plant bases of omega-3s, not as high as the fish, uh, avocados, and some of the nuts, like walnuts, also have some of those omega-3s. Okay, berries, which we had today. So berries are very high in flavonoids, and a flavonoid is basically a plant nutrient substance. It gives color, but also there's some research to to show that it may delay, again, that cognitive decline by almost two and a half years. And how many of you heard about blueberries as brain, brain food? Okay, so again, um, there's certainly no reason not to eat blueberries. If you like them, go for it. Uh, the research is still emerging, so that means we can't say exactly there's a correlation. If you eat blueberries, your brain is going to be healthier. However, the research is showing that there seems to be a tie, especially with blueberries and strawberries. So they did a study on women in particular, and they found that women who eat about two and a half cups of berries, strawberries and blueberries, over the course of a week, seem to have a slower decline by almost two and a half years. So we had some today. They must have knew. So, um, so think about that. And berries are available now all season long. It doesn't have to be fresh from the garden. You can use frozen blueberries um, and use them in, you know, whether you want to bake them or put them in smoothies. So there's lots of options there. Um, tea and coffee. With tea and coffee, really, um, you're going to see something short term in terms of the caffeine. Um, and they found that people who drink coffee or tea that has caffeine in it or another beverage uh, do better on mental um, tests. They function on the mental functioning tests. They do better if they're having some caffeine before that, which kind of makes sense. But it's very short term, so it's not going to last. And then walnuts, as I mentioned earlier, again, really good sources of those omega-3s. So, and I think we had some walnuts in our chicken salad today, too. So, again, helping with that slower of that decline. And I'm really focusing a lot on this decline, not because I'm trying to, to prevent Alzheimer's, but thinking about as caregivers. You know, like what, what um, Rhonda said this morning is it's all about taking care of yourself, too. And taking those moments, we'll talk about in, in the next slide, uh, for yourself, but also having that healthy diet that Kelly mentioned, too. It's very important that we try to, when we are eating, try to fit in some of these foods. It is hard. But think about, like, just what they did today. If you're making a salad, why not throw some fruit in there? Or why not throw some nuts in there to get some of these benefits from these nutrients? Um, and so, some on the other side, um, they're really looking at the chia seeds as well. Um, the skins of the apple are, are coming up, and uh, quinoa, which is, we know is a really great um, plant-based protein. Okay. Um, Does quinoa have a significant amount of protein? Yes. Actually, quinoa is um, one of maybe two of plant-based proteins that are considered a complete protein. In other words, it's equal to eating a piece of meat. It has all the same essential amino acids in it. So if you, know, if you have friends that are vegetarian or you're a vegetarian, you probably, uh, they're probably using quinoa as a big staple of their diet. It's also high in uh, fiber. And um, it's great to have it in a salad. I mean, it would have been easy to throw some quinoa on that salad. Or you can eat it cold in a salad or eat it warm. Um, it's, how many of you have had quinoa here? Most of you. OK. So some people either love it or they don't. I think sometimes it just takes a while to find the way that you like it best and use it that way. I use it in place of rice. There you go. Yeah. Because, you know, if, especially with white rice, white rice is really low on the nutrient scale as grains go, and probably quinoa is near the top because of that great source of protein. I think about a cup of protein, um, I'm estimating here, is at least eight um, I'm sorry, a cup of quinoa is about eight grams of protein, which is like eating, and it might be even a little bit more, which is like eating an egg in terms of the grams of protein. 
Okay, and turmeric is a spice that um, for a while they're doing lots of research on that. Okay, so the second step is regular uh, ex um, exercise or activity. So staying active, we know, can improve not only our ha heart and circulation, but also our brain, because we have arteries going to our brain and we want that blood flow as well. Um, so here's a couple of benefits. Um, we already probably know many of these, reducing the risk of certain chronic conditions like diabetes and heart disease. We know people who are more physically active um, have uh, either less depression or maybe more milder symptoms if they have depression. And of course with stroke, stroke is related to poor blood flow to the brain. So if you're, if you're being physically active, you're pushing that blood through the circulation system. It can prevent falls. How can it do that? Anybody? I, yeah, yeah, being physically active. I'm sorry, what did you say, Michael? Balance. Balance, balance and strength. Like we were talking at our table today about uh, classes out there that not only offer cardio, which would be like maybe cycling, swimming, walking, but you also want to look for um, activities that build strength, maybe like by um, uh, um, Balak's, excuse me, like yoga or Pilates classes, or build strength where you're doing something with weights. So having that, that what we call that triple, um, that little triangle for physical activity is good. So we don't have to be cardio, we don't have to be uh, thinking about cardio all the time. Um, and also, it may improve that connection with our brain cells in terms of, again, having that blood flow and being able for those cells to transmit and talk to each other. Um, as always, um, when you're going to start maybe a new physical activity, always check with your healthcare provider to make sure that whatever you want to try kind of fits in with your healthcare plan. And then think about where you are being active if you're participating in programs that they offer safe options for you. Okay, the next step would be keeping your brain active. So anytime you learn new things, you engage your brain. And by picking up a new hobby, um, trying a new type of physical activity, maybe doing some other uh, skill, you're, you're engaging your brain and then you're hopefully keeping your brain healthy. So here's some ideas here. If you're a book reader now and you like a certain type of book or magazine, you may, you may want to switch off. So if you're like a people, people magazine reader, maybe reading something like a National Geographic, which kind of provides different information, a little bit more thinking about the content. Or if you're playing games and you like to do crossword puzzles or Sudokus, maybe finding um, um, jigsaw puzzles, or if you have uh, a group that you like to be with, maybe consider doing some board games and things like that. Or then taking a class or joining a club. Um, so there's lots of options out there um, in terms of what's available. There's a lot of new things that are happening in clubs, and we were talking also at my table. If you're not familiar with, um, Kent County has a Parks and Recreation Center, which is very close to the border of Queen Anne's, and she was sharing with me that you don't have to be a resident of Kent County to join. You can join at Queen Anne's, and it's very inexpensive, and they have a great facility. I think you were saying it was like $5 to join? So if you, know, if you live in, in that area of the county, that might be a really good option for you. Okay. Fourth step is social connection, connections, and I know Rhonda was also speaking of that too. There is so much research out there about people who are socially connected, whether it's through groups, family, um, whatever the case may be, not only do they feel happier, but they have better health outcomes. So think about what you can do. So there's some, some ideas there about volunteering or possibly working. Any of you volunteer in the community? Raise your hands, okay. Um, do you care to share where you volunteer? Right, in the church, okay, okay. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, similar. I, I live on Kent Island, and I volunteer at church. And I also work at Haven Ministries, mm -hmm. uh, a homeless shelter. Um, my wife's very active in the board. Right. But I used to coach uh, youth sports and mm -hmm. help just stay active. Right. 
And, and I understand as caregivers, you're probably thinking, how in the heck do I have time to volunteer? I barely have time for myself. For some people, volunteering is time for themselves. Some people like that idea of being able to give back, and at the same time, you're getting a, a double benefit is you're having that social connection. You know, so think about it. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that you do all the time. I know animal shelters are looking for people to walk dogs. I know within Extension, we have master volunteer, uh, uh, master guard, Master Garden volunteer programs. With 4-H, you can volunteer as well to, to help in uh, youth activities. So there's lots of options and ideas out there. It's a good way to meet people and have that social interaction. And then also just, uh, again, maybe joining social clubs where people might meet. I know in, you mentioned Kent Island. I do some work in Kent Island Senior Center. And every second Wednesday of the month, they have a lunch bunch group. So seniors from that group just go out and have lunch together so and then again local programs and organizations okay all right the fifth one getting enough sleep does anybody get enough sleep here raise your hand yay there's a few people great <laughs> okay sleep is becoming um i just recently went to a conference in philadelphia and they're looking as lack of sleep as being possibly the next chronic disease because it ties in to so much about our health. Um, so let's take a look first at some of the benefits before we get into some of the hours and so forth. So we know it helps your brain think more clearly. Think about it. If you haven't had a good night's sleep, poor decisions, not getting behind the wheel, maybe not thinking clearly, um, it could decrease the risk for obesity. This is something most people don't realize, that while you sleep, there's hormones in your body that have to reset for your appetite. And if you're not getting enough sleep, then you're not, that's not going to happen. And they're doing research on people that are obese, and they're looking at their sleep patterns, and they're finding that people, that part of that problem, or part of their weight, can be related to lack of sleep. Um, Heart disease, of course, again, the same thing. During that sleep time, your blood pressure drops, your pulse drops, which is giving your heart rest at that time. And then for uh, also during sleep, your immune system is also resetting. So think about how important the sleep is. Um, it's recommended somewhere between seven to eight hours. Some people can function perfectly on six and a half. So if you're getting up and you're feeling good at six and a half hours, um, six would probably be the least amount that you would get the full benefits of helping your brain and doing all these, then you might be okay. Because some people sleep nine hours and still feel unrested when they wake up. So the key is you know, how you're feeling uh, in terms of your rest. And as we age, it is a misconception that once we become adults, the sleep that we need is about the same between that seven to eight hours a day. And in some cases, it's okay to take a nap but you don't want to nap more than a half hour because then your body starts to go through the different sleep, uh, sleep stages and when you wake up then it, it gets disrupted. So try to keep your naps to short if you have time for naps. Um, so I recently went to that same conference. I'm very interested in sleep and I heard, um, I, I sat in on a speaker who's a sleep doctor. Um, I, guess, I think he called himself a sleep pathologist. But in any event, this is like going to be like the third pillar of health. So we're going to have physical activity, we're going to have healthy diet, and sleep. And what he did say was probably the key thing is, is about the routine. So think about setting a routine for yourself at night. Think, try it for a week where you have a routine. See if you don't sleep better. So some things you might want to do is your routine might be maybe reading a book at night, um, hopefully something that's relaxing. Um, it might be taking a bath, because we know heat and water can help re relax us and um, get us ready for sleep. The dark, quiet, cool environment's important. Use of electronics, cell phones, laptops, so forth. We all know that that's interfering with our sleep. And of course, the alcohol and caffeine late in the day. So these are all um, things that you can do to improve your sleep. Does anybody have any questions on the the steps and things that we can do. Yes? I have a question. Um, I know it's important, like, the seven to eight hours to be, like, uninterrupted sleep, mm -hmm. per se. 
how about if you get that amount of sleep, but it's interrupted? In other words, like, you know, you're really, really tired, you, you go ahead and go to sleep, but then three hours, you're awake, you're up for maybe two hours, mm -hmm. and then you go back for the rest. Okay. I mean, that's a hard one. That's <laughs> yeah. That's a really good question, and he did address that. So basically he said, if, you're, if you go to sleep, and you get up and let's say you have to go to the bathroom or whatever, and you can fall back to sleep within that next 15 minutes, then you're gonna get the benefits. If for some reason you can't fall asleep in that half hour, within a half hour time from when you got up, get out of bed. Get out of bed, walk around, do something, because otherwise you're just gonna lay in bed and you're gonna start thinking about all the things you have to do the next day or anything. So the idea is to get out of get out of that. So as far as that interruption, again it goes back to if you're sleeping those two or three hours and you have to and you're up for an hour and you go back, how are you feeling after you wake up? Do you feel somewhat rested? Okay. So if you if you're feeling rested, then that should be able to work for you because you're getting that seven to eight hours. And it's pretty close together. But if you were taking like three hours of sleep and then not sleeping again for another six hours and getting four hours, that would, you're not gonna have that time. Because you, your body goes through those stages of sleep and it can deal with an interruption for a short period of time, but not for a long period of time. But that's a good question because that came up as well, is what defines you know, quality of sleep. So, and sometimes people stress, stress about sleep. Anybody ever say, oh my God, I'm not sleeping enough and get stressed out about it? Okay, <laughs> I'm one of them. So I really, I, I have to say just for myself, I, I, I have trouble sleeping and I d developed a routine and my routine is working for me and I'll be happy to share it with you, but it's basically a, a, a small half cup of chamomile tea, about four ounces. I have a CD that has very um, uh, quiet music and I put that on and within 50, I always fall asleep before the CD is over, so it works for me. So I've been doing that on a regular basis, and that helps. So find something that works for you. Yes. Yes. And it has the ocean waves. Yes, like the white noises. Yes, yeah. that's another option too as well. Um, or if you don't have those options, you know, again, the the cold, the cooler temperatures is, is also key because once our body is cool, we start to um, our our blood pressure, our heart our heart. Uh, rate drops too, and that gets us ready for sleep. Because that's the whole thing. We have to get our body ready for sleep. Okay. So, um, do you like using an electric blanket? Does it help you sleep? Okay, but do you so do you sleep well? Then okay, then go for it. It works for you. Whatever works for you, because it's very individualized. Everyone has uh, different things that work. Um, some people don't like the heat, they like to be a little cooler. Some people have cold feet, that sort of thing, they like to wear socks. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly go through some of these different um, brain health risks because there are some threats out there that can interfere or um, impact our, our brain health in general. So just to, you could see the five that we're going to go through, the accidents, alcohol, smoking and related risks, medicine and some health conditions. Okay, so one of the risk factors um, for, for brain injury in general is of course accidents. And we have to remember they happen at any age, but as we do get older, um, the risk of falls and other accidents can cause injury. So um, thinking about your home, what kinds of things can you do at your home to prevent an accident. Let's, let's use fall as an example. You might be working with uh, older adults and you already do this. Yes? Yes. Good. Good. I agree 100% with you on that. My mother, uh, when my mother was alive, I'd go see her. She tripped. She broke her hip on a throw rug. I threw it away. Next time I came back, she had another one. I took that and I threw, it was like this ongoing game every time um, that she had these throw rugs. My mother was like that. She would have a lot of throw rugs, and when she was living with me, she had to put it in the bathroom. I'm like, no, ma'am. No. Oh, gosh, the bathroom would be a tough one. I saw another hand back there as well. Oh, no, I was just going to say throw rugs, scatter rugs, papers, extension 
boards. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we go into houses to do like a home um, safety assessment, those are the first things we look for is like clean, you know, through thoroughway, through and out. But fire hazard, you look for, there's all kinds of reasons. Right. Like fall. Right. Uh, fire potential, you know, um, if you're going to have to bring a room from the second floor to the first floor, how you're going to make that happen. Right. You know, take care of people. The extension cords are a very good one too. Yeah. Yes, I saw. Yes. Well, I was going to say throw out throw rugs, <laughs> but but well well lit. I'm a big fan of Excellent. adequate light. Yes, yes. Lighting is key, um, especially as we get older. Sometimes I know in my house, I'm constantly having the lights on, and and my family just doesn't understand why. I just like things well lit. But lighting is very important too. And you, I think she alluded to also clutter. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you're working with older adults, they like to save things. And sometimes they're piling things around and they say, I know where it is, I'm good, but they forget. So, you know, you want to make sure from that aspect, but also ourselves too, yes. Another one that we worked in was a can tell you a, a lot of seniors fall over their pets. Pets. I know. And sometimes you have to give them suggestions or you know, teach them is to contain, you know, like maybe if somebody's ringing the doorbell, leash the dog up, put mm -hmm. it in the bathroom, something, then you don't answer. Right. Anybody here ever fall over their pet? <laughs> I, ha I have a cat who just loves to rub my leg and I. I fell a couple of times, so uh, yes, I agree 100% with pets. But pets, however, um, I, I would hope no one would want to get rid of those pets for their people they're taking care of because we know that that's a way sometimes for people. There, it's a little social support and it keeps them company. So after the third confession, I would say. Yeah, maybe after that. <laughs> Let's hope. Yes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that's when we get to, um, so I think we kind of hit most of these. Um, just things for yourself too, we know, safety belts save lives. Um, also, if you're a motorcycle rider or a bike rider, those helmets also save and protect our brain. Um, some places offer fall prevention classes, so you might pick up a couple of hints there as well. And um, vision checking as well. And there's that sleep again, because sleep can relate to how, how we're feeling and functioning. OK, alcohol. So a little bit about alcohol. Um, alcohol is something that, you know, if it's within your health care provider's plan that you have in terms of your chronic diseases or your medications that you're on, um, that's something you have to discuss with them. However, the U.S. dietary guidelines, the most recent ones, which are through the end of this year, um, suggest that up to one drink per day for women and two for men is kind of what they suggest or recommend. So some people like to have maybe a glass of wine at night and that helps relax you. That's fine. But just keep in mind if that interferes with your, um, your health um, plans. And that might be your way of just de-stressing too, uh, as well. Um, also think um, about if you're, if you're drinking too much, we know that it impairs our brain, um, it can affect our memory, et cetera, our coordination. But um, also think about the mixture with the medications, whether you're taking over-the-counter medications, whether you're taking um, uh, prescription medications, and again, I'll talk a little bit more about um, herbal remedies as well in a second, but those can also be impacted by alcohol as well. So again, you know, drink responsibly is basically it. Um, a little bit about smoking because there is some um, new research also looking at smoking and brain health and it makes sense because smoking we know a risk factor, a health condition that's a risk factor for smoking is stroke. And stroke is basically occurs when there's not enough blood flow to the brain. So if you're able to quit smoking, then you can decrease your risk, of course, by, of lung cancer, but also for stroke. Um, also, um, you're, you're, cutting back down, uh, you're cutting down on the amount of secondhand smoke that you're producing. 
but also think too of the quality of air outside as well. So sometimes it's good to get outside, get some fresh air. Um, for those of you who have, if yourself or anyone you know that's interested in quitting, both health departments in Kent and Queen Anne's County and also in Cecil, all health departments have great resources for people who want to quit smoking. So, and many of them are free. So feel free to contact them. Medicines, um, some medicines can actually be, be a risk factor in how they function with your brain um, or how they uh, function, uh, impact brain function. So always talk with your healthcare provider. And again, it goes back to the mixing of prescription and over the counter and also mixing of herbal supplements. Most people think, oh, it's herbs. What can that do? There's so much research out um, with certain herbs that can interact with um, prescription medications. And you have to be really careful with that. And if you're caring for someone that's on herbal remedy, remedies and you happen to be taking them to their doctor's appointments, make sure they're always including them on the list of things they're taking. Vitamins we naturally think about over-the-counter prescription, but sometimes you forget about those herbal re remedies. And I'm not talking about putting rosemary on food or things like that. I'm talking about um, concentrated herbal remedies, whether they're in uh, liquid form or whether they're in pill form. Not to say you can't take them, but just let your health care provider know that you are taking them. I'm going to just go real quickly through a couple um, health conditions because there's some interesting information coming out um, about how some of these health conditions are actor actually affecting our brain. Heart disease, again, kind of makes sense. We already talked about that. It can lead to stroke or blood vessel changes in your brain. So you want to make sure you, if you have high cholesterol, you're managing that. If you don't, still manage it. Control your blood pressure. Now, by controlling your blood pressure, we probably know, yes, there's medications out there. Or, yes, there's low-sodium diets. How many of you know that in addition to the low-sodium or eating foods low in sodium, that you can also better improve your blood pressure by eating foods high in potassium. Does anybody know that? I see a couple hands. That's the newest research out there, and if you're familiar with the DASH diet, that's exactly what it purports. So basically it says, don't just take out foods that are high in sodium, add foods high in potassium. Anybody want to take some guesses at foods that are high in potassium? Bananas. bananas. Everyone says bananas first. Eggplant. Eggplant. Sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes. How about, how about I make it really simple? Fruits and vegetables, okay? But yes, there's some higher, like bananas, potatoes, sweet potatoes, tomatoes, but fruits and vegetables are excellent sources of potassium. So again, going back to that lunch today, they couldn't have planned a better lunch for us because not only did we get the berries, we got lots of potassium if you took those salads. Um, so think about that if it's your own blood pressure or if it's someone that you're taking care of and it's within their diet restrictions, add more fruits and vegetables, okay? Also, breads are a good source of potassium too, but you're mostly gonna get it from fruits and vegetables. A lot of those dark green leafy vegetables, like the spinach, the, uh, the kale, and so forth, also very good sources of potassium. Eat healthy, we talked about that, including smoking, limiting alcohol, and then again, your air pollution. But the main thing for the heart disease is gonna be your diet and watching your cholesterol numbers and your blood pressure. Diabetes, this is, this is gonna, there's a lot of information about diabetes in the news in, in the brain. So we all know about type one. Type one is usually the one with insulin. There's about 5% of the population that has that. The other 95% have the type two. Has anyone heard about the new hypothesized type 3 diabetes? Okay. And again, I'm emphasizing it's a hypothesis. So that means they're thinking about it. Right now, the, the medical con, um, community is not, um, what's the right word I want to use here? They're, um, they're, it's not widely accepted. However, they're looking at a type 3 diabetes. And I'm going, to, I'm going to reference my note because this is very new out there, and again, this was at the same conference I went to, that it describes that Alzheimer's disease, which is a major cause of dementia, is triggered by a type of insulin resistance that occurs specifically in the brain. 
So this is something, again, it's a hypothesis. Please don't leave and say, Beverly said this. <laughs> I'm just sharing some information in case you hear about it in the news. They are studying this. There's a lot of research money going into Alzheimer's disease causes, et cetera, but there's, they're noticing that they're seeing some, some ties and some uh, relationships with the insulin resistance and Alzheimer's disease. So I'm just putting that out there as kind of as an FYI that there's some information you know out there. But with uh, as with any kind of um, chronic disease, again, there's diet, physical activity, and making sure you're following uh, the management practices your healthcare provider might give you. All right, and this is going to sound redundant, but we're going to talk about sleep. Again, it, there is a risk factor with our brain, and just putting it back out there, um, what you can do in terms of getting your, your seven to eight hours. If you really feel like you have a sleep condition, there are lots of sleep specialists out there, and most medical insurances will take care of that. Sometimes you might need to use a device. Sometimes they may recommend medication. Um, or it might be simply... Um, taken care of by relaxation tips, which we're going to have in a few minutes, so I'm excited about that. But think about that, too, is it, they are looking at a sleep as a third pillar of health for us. All right, and then just a quick word about dementia here. Um, it, it's, it is the buildup of that harmful protein, which I mentioned earlier, that beta amyloid. So basically what happens is it builds up around the cells and neurons, and it kills off the, the brain cells. And then we lose that connection of the different cells talking to each other. So we know age is a factor, but we also know that genes now is a factor. And they are looking at head injury, in particular, multiple concussions. So again, that's something that they're looking into and whether stroke plays a role in that as well. But you're starting to see an underlying theme here and sometimes we don't want to hear about it. Healthy diet, physical activity, and then controlling those other um, conditions. And there are some cognitive brain training programs out there that really kind of go through different steps and, and so forth to help um, keep your skills level up. Okay. Any questions so far? We're just about wrapping up. Yes. Um, so I work with an audiology practice, and one of the things that we talk about a lot with our patients is uh, untreated hearing loss mm. and, and the risk that it does to your brain health. Are you familiar with any of those studies? Or No, I'm not actually. And when I was preparing for this, you know, that's interesting. It makes so much sense, but I did not see anything. Is there anything that, that he <coughs> shared with, that, that you know of that you want to share? Well, there was, there was a study out of uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, Frank Lynn, he was a leading physician up there, and he correlated the uh, early onset of dementia with untreated hearing loss. And it actually ties, I'm amazed to see that a lot of the same uh, issues that you're seeing and what you're presenting mm -hmm. are also tied to the inability to hear properly. Right. And, and untreated. That, you know, it's it's a, something that, that um, uh, prevents the brain from progressing. Sure. If anything, it, it, it causes a, a d decline. Right. Uh, you know, a, a, a loss of gray matter. It makes, it, from how you're describing it, it, makes perfect sense because a lot of how we learn is not only through what we see, but what we hear. And if we're not hearing, then we're cutting off a source of information coming in. So that's really interesting. Now, it, it actually never came up in when, it, when I was doing this work, but that makes a lot of sense um, when you think about that. Because it does all tie into going back to the signals in our brain. Um, again, that you're hopefully you're seeing that just more within, well, not hopefully, but you're seeing that more within the people that you're taking care of, but thinking also about yourselves as well. It, you know? it, there's an ongoing study at Hopkins, and unfortunately, studies take time. They do, but but especially human are, studies. Yeah. Yes, and so they are treating. Um, they have a group, a population that they're treating with various kinds of hearing uh, devices, mm -hmm. anything from a personal amplifier, you know, basically a little walkie-talkie almost kind of thing, to hearing aids to see if they actually curtail and, and kind of help bring back 
Interesting. Uh, cognitive responses, things like that. Right. So it is not, so we should in the next, uh, as I said, it's ongoing study. A person I talked to about it, said it was a 10 year study, mm -hmm. and they're about halfway through. Right. So, but it takes time. It does. If you're talking about a large population and not an easy thing to track. And you want to make sure that your study re results are very relevant and just not thrown out there. Because we've had some studies out there in other different health areas that maybe were done too quickly and then realized that those results weren't necessarily yeah, valid. Yeah, yeah, the correlation between the, the early onset actually was, was from a study that was looking at something completely different. Right. So that's the reason it's not you know, similar to a lot of this set in stone. Right. Um, but it was found. I know there, there are studies not quite related to that, but they're doing lots of studies within younger populations and they're hearing in terms of all the devices that they use, whether it's headphones, whatever, um, loud music. I know they're doing it on that, but I'm not quite sure exactly what they're studying, whether it's just hearing loss or taking it to the next step, like is it related to um, brain health as well down the line. Okay. Um, all right. So. I just want to go into the, our last slide here. So where do we start? So um, lots of information today. And again, this one pager that I gave you, um, if you go on their website, there's lots more information available to you. But you want to start thinking about what you can do for yourself um, first and um, to, get to, to get moving along, to take care, better care of, of your brain. So these are just some examples, for example, uh, for seeing here, scheduling a health screening or physical exam if you haven't done one in a while. Review your medicines with your health care provider. This is so important. It's interesting because we have a program that we do through University of Maryland Extension called How to Talk to Your Doctor. And it really came about because we're finding that not only that people are uncomfortable talking to the doctor, there's not enough time, not enough questions, but we're also finding that the doctors are feeling they're not getting enough information back to make sound decisions. So think about um, taking some time, making that list, and bringing it to your healthcare provider the next time you go. And sometimes that will save time as well, and more time to have a conversation. Um, also think about adding servings of whether it's vegetables or fruit each day. We already saw all the benefits in terms of the vegetables with the different nutrients they have for our brain and, and we know for the, I just shared about the potassium with um, helping with managing blood pressure, being active, whether it's um, some sort of a um, physical activity or try a new food. Some people like to journal. I noticed, some, I think some tables were giving out journals. Or find a community center that you want to be active in or maybe within your group today you've met some people that you want to start a support group with. Because I heard when um, Rhonda was talking that people said, we don't, you know, I'm by myself, we, do, we don't have any time, or we don't have friends because we're so consumed with taking care of our loved ones. So that might be something there. And it might be something just setting up phone calls. All right, so um, any other questions? Okay. So what I'd like to do, what you'd like you to do is take a look at this protecting your brain health card, which you can take home with you. And that little sticky note, see if there's anything on there as a call to action today that you're going to do for yourself to help maintain a good brain function as we go through our journey of life. And then if you don't mind sticking it up here, so we could kind of maybe as a group just look to see what people um, are thinking of doing, and that might spark some ideas for others. All right. Wow, I see lots of sleep up here. <laughs> I guess I'm not surprised. Um, I see adequate fluids, um, exercise, eat or drink less sugar, salt, and fats. Yes. Okay. Another exercise. Another exercise. I'm seeing controlling portions. That's another good one because certainly if you're eating less and you want to maintain a healthy weight, which ties into a lot of those chronic diseases we talked about, um, walk an hour each day. That's awesome. Start a food journal by improving awareness of my intake. That's wonderful. Sometimes, we, well, not sometimes, we know that when you write it down, it really gets you thinking. Um, Make physical activity part of my routine. 
more exercise, portion sizes, stretching, and more sleep. Oh, further reduce sugar and increase um, intake. Um, ex I'm sorry, increase exercise. So lots of good things call to action. So write them down on your card or, and see if you could do what you committed to for a week. And if not, start over or pick something else. But think about what you can do that can keep your, your brain healthy and functioning because it is the most important um, um, organ in our body. And that's probably when you talk to people as we get older, the one thing that we're all kind of fearful of is not being able to have great brain, brain function. Um, so anyway. Um, just to close, University of Maryland Extension, um, I actually cover Cecil Kent and Queen Anne's counties. I'm a community educator, so if you're interested in any programming, my field is really um, nutrition, health, and wellness, but I do lots of other programs within health literacy and so forth. Thank you. Thank you.